So here's the secret to getting fit, getting good grades, and becoming a confident public speaker. Classical conditioning. And no, that's not some ancient Greek hair product, but something discovered by Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov in the early 1900s. Pavlov was collecting dog saliva. When he discovered that dogs would salivate not only in response to food, but in response to things associated with food. In a series of experiments, Pavlov conditioned the dogs to salivate in response to neutral stimulus, like a metronome, a tone, or a light bulb. From these experiments, we understand the process of classical conditioning to have the following parts. So let's unpack what these parts are exactly by looking into Pavlov's experimental process. First, Pavlov repeatedly exposed the dogs to two stimuli together. This is the unconditional stimulus, because even without the conditioning process, it induces a response. It makes the dogs drool. This is the conditional stimulus, because it needs the help of the conditioning process to create a response. Nothing about a thousand hertz tone is inherently delicious, but with conditioning, it induces the same response as the unconditional stimulus. As the two stimuli are presented together repeatedly, the dogs undergo a process known as acquisition, where they learn to associate the tone with the food, and the response of drooling becomes not only an unconditional response to food, but a conditional response to the conditional stimulus. All you need to do is play the beep to make the dog drool. With this model, we can look at some common examples of this phenomenon. For instance, much of advertising relies on classical conditioning. Often, ads are an effort to associate a company logo with some desirable stimuli, be it cute, sexy, wholesome, or so on. For example, if you show a logo and a cute animal that makes you feel happy, after you undergo acquisition, then the logo will also make you feel happy. Note that advertising also often makes use of higher order conditioning, in which a conditional stimulus is used as an unconditional stimulus for another conditional stimulus. For instance, a company logo can be associated with a new product, so that the new product prompts the same feelings associated with the logo. So say that you often see a logo for a fitness company, next to someone super beautiful and happy. And let's say that when you see these ads, you unconsciously compare yourself to the physical appearance of that person, and maybe you feel a little inadequate. <laughs> Every time you see the logo next to their new fitness drink in a store, you may subconsciously remember feeling inadequate. If the ad campaigns and the packaging do their job well, you might then decide to buy the drink. <laughs> even though it probably tastes super gross and won't actually make you beautiful or happy. But hold on. Classical conditioning might actually be able to help you here to become more conventionally attractive and maybe even more happy. And here's how. A few times a week for about a month, go to the gym and don't exercise. Just pick a few regular times a week and go there. Read some magazines, a book, do something that makes you feel relaxed. Have some fun. Use the gym as a place to unwind. This way, you'll associate the conditional stimulus of the gym with the unconditional stimulus of relaxation and fun. And going to the gym will create the conditional response of feeling happy and relaxed. So you'll want to go there on a regular basis, and you'll be able to keep up the consistent schedule required to achieve your workout goals. After you have undergone such a regime, you might be able to also take advantage here of higher order conditioning to make yourself more happy. Since if you feel more happy when you go to the gym, and you train when you go to the gym, then you might eventually feel happy whenever you train, wherever you train. You can use a similar classical conditioning technique to improve your studying habits. Every time you study, drink a peppermint tea. And while you're drinking, just study. No distractions, only take a break once you finish the tea. Over time, you'll learn to associate peppermint tea with focusing on your studies, so that all you need to do to focus is to drink some tea. 
You also might have heard a similar tip of having a specific place in your house or at the library where you consistently study and focus so that all you need to do to focus is to go to that location. But be careful. This technique is vulnerable to the process that comes after acquisition, extinction. If you start regularly checking social media in your study area or drinking tea whenever you want, your conditional response will fade. Pavlov observed this process in his dogs. If he presented the conditional stimulus alone for several trials, the conditional response would diminish. But after extinction, there is another process that might help you get your focus back. Spontaneous recovery. As observed in Pavlov's dogs, if after some extended time, the conditional stimulus is brought back, then the conditional response will reappear. But if you don't reinforce it with the unconditional stimulus, then it'll go through a second extinction period. So get off your phone and keep studying. What's notable about this spontaneous recovery process is that it shows that the conditioned learning is not removed forever in the extinction process. Rather, the subject learns that the conditional stimulus no longer predicts the unconditional stimulus for now, but with some time, it might come to predict it again. You might also be able to use extinction to your advantage to cope with phobias. As observed in several studies, classical conditioning is one way to explain the emergence of phobias. In studies where lab rats are conditioned to associate some neutral stimulus, like a noise, with some negative stimulus, like a shock, rats are observed to develop fearful behavior towards the neutral stimulus and towards the area in which the experiment was conducted. They develop phobias of the noise and of the chamber. Alternately, conditioning could cause a fear of public speaking. Say, during a big career-making or breaking presentation, your slides went dead and you forgot the rest of your speech. And you could do nothing. This experience would probably make you associate the unconditional response of embarrassment, shame, and despair with the conditional stimulus of public speaking. But remember, extinction happens when the subject is exposed to the conditional stimulus without the unconditional stimulus. So if you practice public speaking in front of a sympathetic audience, if everything goes all right a few times in a row, then that fear might go away. In fact, if it goes really well, you might even develop a positive association. But it's likely that the best that you can hope for is just a bit of stage fright, but nothing that you can't deal with. Note that a phobia, like a fear of public speaking, probably has some degree of generalization. Generalization happens when stimuli that are similar to the conditional stimulus generate the conditional response. For example, Pavlov's dogs would produce saliva in response to tones that were close in frequency to the trained tone. That is, the response was generalized to the surrounding tones, and the more similar the stimulus, the stronger the response. After our hypothetical disaster presentation, if you did develop a fear of public speaking, then this conditioned behavior has undergone some generalization. You didn't previously have a bad experience at every podium and stage in existence, only at your unlucky presentation. But now situations similar to that presentation are enough to prompt that fearful conditional response. In other words, your one bad experience on the podium has caused you to generalize that all public speaking situations will end in disaster. In contrast to generalization, discrimination in classical conditioning refers to when a conditional response occurs only after a conditional stimulus, not after stimuli that are similar. In this graph, we can see that Pavlov's dogs do demonstrate some degree of discrimination. Although they respond to tones that are very similar to the conditional stimulus, they are able to discriminate these primary tones from tones that are not as similar to the conditional stimulus. And they probably wouldn't respond to just any noise that Pavlov plays. Hello. That is, their response would discriminate between different noises. So if the failed presentation happened to someone with more past experience of public speaking, like a professional performer, they might only develop a fear of speaking in that location or about that subject. 
but be able to perform fine in other venues and on other topics. In this case, the conditional response shows a higher degree of discrimination, since the conditional response only responds to the original conditional stimulus and not to similar stimuli. Finally, there are a few more subtleties to unpack about classical conditioning. We'll do so with the help of John Garcia's taste aversion studies. Garcia first gave rats a flavored solution, then, sometime later, subjected them to radiation, which induced nausea. After only a single trial, this nausea caused the rats to develop a taste aversion to the solution. This happened even if the rats were irradiated a few hours after they consumed the solution. This study demonstrated that classical conditioning can occur after only a single trial, and even with a long delay between the conditional stimulus and the unconditional stimulus. But note that this study also demonstrated that these discoveries are not true of all instances of conditioning. That is, acquisition is easier and faster with some sets of stimuli than with others. For instance, food and illness are easier to associate with each other than noise and illness. Huh? Alternately, whereas it might only take one bad experience to give you severe stage fright, it'll probably take long-term and repeated effort to make some magic focus tea and to make you love going to the gym. So get working. <laughs>